Good afternoon and welcome back to AN Awareness Week 2022. Our diamond sponsor, the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, has put together a really great series of presentations for the week. So far, we've discussed multidisciplinary care for AN patients and uh, hearing rehabilitation yesterday. Today, Dr. Wren is once again providing his experience and is joined by Dr. Leslie Kim, and we're going to discuss facial nerve regeneration. Dr. Kim will go through her presentation, and there will be plenty of time for patient questions once she's done. Doctors, I'd like to thank your entire team for the time and effort put into these webinars and for your thorough answers to all of our questions. I also want to let patients know that there are many resources available on the ANA website. These are relevant to those who were recently diagnosed, as well as those who continue to face issues because of their acoustic neuroma. So take a look around at anausa.org. And if you need any help at all, please feel free to contact us directly, either through email or by calling our office. Okay, before we get started, I wanna quickly go over how the presentation will work today. Uh, let's see. Sorry, something bad is happening. Okay, all of our attendees are muted, so you're only able to listen. If you have any questions during the presentation, click the Q&A button in your toolbar and type your questions there if you're on the webinar or add them in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook. There should be captions at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see them, click the captions button in your toolbar to activate them. If you're watching on Facebook, they should be active. You might have to activate them in your settings if you don't see them. We will record this presentation and house it in the presentation section on the AN Awareness Week page. Both of the webinars from this week are already there and ready to view. We'll also keep it on our Facebook page and add it to the video library on our website. There are lots of ways to get involved in Awareness Week this week, so visit the website and click the slider on the home page to find everything you need to know. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn my camera on. And um, Dr. Kim, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely, hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Dr. Leslie Kim. I, I think am... you might be muted. Uh, no, see. you're good. I'm good? Okay. <laughs> I'm Dr. Leslie Kim. I'm at the Ohio State so University Wexner Medical Center as the um, Director of Facial Plastic Surgery. Um, I am a facial nerve reanimation. Um, I'm very passionate about participating in that. So I hope to share with you some of that information today. So I'm gonna pause for a second because I hear a little bit of an echo. Can you hear me okay, Dr. Ryan and Melissa? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, excellent. All right. so. I'm going to talk to you today about contemporary facial reanimation. So let's see here. So I'm going to start with just some background information. And I know that um, a lot of you are very sophisticated with your knowledge about the facial nerve, as well as, uh, um, you know, acoustic neuromas and vestibular schwannomas. I'll talk to you sort of as I would speak to a patient if you were in my office. So the facial nerve um, is the main nerve that brings energy into the muscles of the face. So there's 10,000 neurons and neurons are what conduct energy and 7,000 of them come into our face um, through the facial nerve. So it travels in through the, the bone of behind the ear called the temporal bone, which is where the tumors um, exist. So let's see if I can advance here. Okay. And the purpose of the facial nerve, it's, it comes out from the bone and then it exits into the face and it sends off multiple branches um, all throughout the face um, from the top to the bottom. And the purpose of it, like I said, is just simply to provide energy or electricity to the muscles to turn them on. And one thing that's really helpful in this diagram in particular is that if you look at the face in real life and in the diagram, there's a lot of overlapping branches in the middle of the face, whereas not so much in the upper face and the lower face. And I bring this up because if you have a facial nerve paralysis after surgery and you recover, you're quickly going to see, or if you're going to recover, you're going to see the recovery in the middle of the face first. So I always tell people when you expect recovery, you should see an improvement improvement in the crease of your of your mid face, then you might see that the lower lid that was once saggy is no longer saggy. 
and then you'll see movement long before you'll see movement in the lower lip and the forehead. And that's really important because a lot of patients come in and they're very upset because they don't see any movement in their forehead, but they forget how much they've gotten back in their middle of the face. So this is the explanation of why that occurs. So as I said, a lot of overlap in the middle of the face. So again, the facial nerve is providing electricity to the muscles of the face, and we have 43 muscles involved in facial expression, just all kind of pictured here. So causes of facial paralysis, when we're looking at tertiary academic centers, acoustic neuromas actually tend to be the second most common cause after Bell's palsy. Um, there's lots of other reasons for facial paralysis, but certainly um, is a person or a patient experiencing acoustic neuroma, you're not alone in that number. So when I see a patient with facial paralysis, I always start with the history to figure out the onset, the duration, and the etiology. So I'm trying to figure out the timeline of when things started. And also very important are a patient's age, their medical history, their goals, and their current function. So when I do an examination to figure out what I can offer, I'm looking at all the different nerves. I'm looking at the face throughout and the upper face, the middle face, the lower face. I'm looking at what the paralysis is like. Is it complete paralysis or is it incomplete? And I'll talk more about that. I'm taking photos and videos to really document and using grading scales to be able to communicate not just with myself over time, but also with other physicians. So complete paralysis is the more obvious facial paralysis that people think of when they think somebody's had a stroke. It basically means that the face is completely without energy and so it oftentimes just looks droopy. So as you can see in this face, you'll see lack of forehead wrinkles, the lower eyelid sags, the eye closure is affected, Opening of the eye is a totally different nerve. So eye opening is not affected, it's closure that's affected. People can lose the fold on their cheek, their mouth corner droops, and of course we don't see movement. What makes facial paralysis so challenging is sometimes when we recover, we can recover completely or we can recover incompletely and there could be a mixture of um, presentations throughout. So incomplete paralysis, meaning that somebody who's recovered but not in a complete fashion can look a little different than flaccid paralysis. So on this side of the face, what happens is more of something called synkinesis. And I'll speak more about that at the very end of the talk. But basically, in somebody who's synkinetic or has incomplete paralysis, almost there's a tightening effect that happens. So the eye becomes smaller, not bigger, because it's tightened. Um, the crease becomes lost, not because it's um, loose, but just over tightened. Again, the corner of the mouth becomes a little bit frozen. And so there's a different picture that happens in incomplete paralysis. And again, we'll talk more about that at the end. So when, if, you, if and when you develop facial paralysis, eye protection is up of the utmost importance because the eye has a covering called the cornea. And if the cornea is not well covered and moisturized, it can cause an ulcer or an abrasion and that can lead to blindness if untreated. So very important is going to be immediately doing supportive care. So I call those lubricating eye drops. Those are all found over the counter. So like refresh eye drops, ointments, taping at nighttime, um, wearing a moisture chamber, contact lenses, all these things. And so a piece of education I always give patients is that a lot of people when they have facial paralysis say, I have a lot of tearing in my eye. Sometimes that tearing is because it's dry. And so remember that if you're having a lot of reflexive tearing, it may actually mean that your eye is dry and it's counterintuitive that you need to put more eye drops in. So I usually tell people if they're awake and um, kind of going about their day, I would put eye drops in like every couple of hours. If you're staring at a TV, you're on the computer, you're watching something, driving, I would even do it every 30 minutes so that you never get that dryness feeling. And then certainly doing other surgeries for the eye can be helpful, like putting in a weight to the upper eyelid to help the eyelid close. And then tacking the lower eyelid can be very beneficial to improve um, lower lid position and also how the eye functions. So I can do a lot of these procedures to make the eye more functional, but I always work very closely with my ophthalmology or eye surgery colleagues because I cannot look at your cornea. That is really limited to eye specialists. So it is very important if you're having dry eye, gritty um, 
gritty sensation, pain, things that don't seem to go away, it's very important to call your eye doctor and not your facial plastic surgeon. So I'm gonna spend a good chunk of the talk talking about dynamic facial reanimation. And why this is important is because um, smiling is one of, one of the most important things that people talk about when they have facial paralysis. And smiling is very complicated because everybody differs in how they smile, but most people on average use about 12 muscles or so to smile. And so, and they use, everyone uses their muscles differently. And so we want to try to reanimate the middle of the face and the smile muscles in a dynamic fashion instead of just statically suspending. So I won't spend a ton of time talking about static suspension. I'll talk about it a little bit because just pulling and statically suspending doesn't really give us a smile. It just gives us maybe a little improvement in symmetry. And so as patients and patient advocates, I wanna empower you with what's important to know. And so the most important thing is that, as I said, the facial nerve brings energy into the facial muscles. When the facial nerve shuts off because of Bell's palsy, acoustic neuroma, whatever it is, it's the muscles that we actually care about because um, the clock starts ticking for the facial muscles from the day of onset of facial paralysis. And it's not doom, gloom, like it's gonna happen immediately, but everything has to do with the muscles because all muscles in our body when they don't get energy from the brain, develop irreversible atrophy and fibrosis or wasting, as you see in this picture, over time. And that time differs, but it's approximately about two years. And so basically when the muscle gets to this point where it's wasted and it cannot be turned back on again, that muscle cannot be reanimated or re-innervated. It actually has to be completely replaced. And so where possible, we want to try to save the facial muscles by innervating it if we don't think the facial nerve is going to come back. So basically, if you know, this is just a scientific diagram of a muscle fiber and the way the nerve connects to the muscle. And so if we don't think the facial nerve is going to turn back on, we want to try to put some other nerves into the face if we can to try to restore tone and movement. And so this is a very busy slide. I use it to share to doctors, but I give it to you because it has a lot of information. And so when it comes down to what I can offer a patient with paralysis, it depends on how long you've been paralyzed and what I think the muscles are doing. So if you've been paralyzed for under about a year and a half or two years, I'm going to try to re-innervate your facial muscles if I can. So if, I, if we've, it's been a year and a half or two since the tumors come out, um, and nothing has gotten better, then I want to try to do mostly nerve transfers or taking other nerves and putting it into the face in an attempt to get it to move again. Whereas if you're in the irreversible paralysis category, meaning it's been over two years, then again, as I said, we have to replace the muscles. And that's where terms like a temporalis tendon transfer or a free gracilis transfer come into play. And this does not, and one thing that I really wanna share with this slide is because you got to irreversible paralysis or more than two, three years or whatever it is, hope is not lost. There's still options for you. So here's an example of a nerve transfer. Um, so in this case, it's the masseter nerve transfer. So this patient, um, her facial nerve did not turn back on. And so what we did was take the masseter nerve, which is the nerve that innervates or brings energy to the chewing muscle in the face. And so under microscope surgery, I took that nerve out of the chewing muscle and I inputted it to the smile uh, nerve or the nerve I thought would do the smile muscle. And so you can see here, six months or so after the procedure, she can clench to turn on the chewing nerve, which then routes into the face and it allows her to smile again. You can see she has an eyelid weight that one of the eye surgeons put in that is starting to look a little heavy. So that might say that perhaps some um, more uh, energy is coming back into the face. So that's an example of masseter nerve transfer. Very commonly these days, I'll do what I call a combined nerve transfer where I'll take the masseter nerve transfer trying to improve smiling, but I'll also do a hypoglossal nerve transfer to try to improve symmetry. So why do these two nerves matter? So the chewing nerve, you clench to be able to smile and clenching to smile is a pretty natural um, motion, although it's not something that, you know, if you catch somebody in a belly laughter, 
um, cracking up from a mass murder transfer, they may not turn it on because it does still require some activity to turn on. Um, and so that's where cross face nerve grafts can become more effective, but a hypoglossal nerve. So your tongue is innervated by the hypoglossal nerve. We have one on each side and the tongue nerve basically is on all the time. We have two tongue nerves on all the time to keep our tongue in the midline and keep it strong. And so I can borrow a little bit of that tongue nerve, which sits in the neck and connect it into the face to be able to send lots of energy all throughout the face, whereas the masseter nerve only goes to smile. So this is an example of somebody who had flaccid paralysis of the left side after a big vestibular schwannoma. And you know, 10 months later, she looks more symmetric at rest. You can see she's starting to get heaviness in the eyelid wave because um, function's starting to come back. The lower lid that used to be more drooped has now come back up to more normal. And then she can clench to get a smile. So a little bit of improvement with that. Sometimes we have to, especially in an older patient, even throw in suspension. So this is a patient who had nerve transfers, but also a suspension to try to improve the symmetry of the face. So not one size fits all. It really is patient dependent on what we offer um, to try to improve the appearance. Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier, if you get to the point where you've been paralyzed for too long, then we have to replace the muscles. And the two main options for that are regional muscle transfer and free gracilis muscle transfer. And so when, when, um, what decision is made between these two is really patient specific. Um, the temporalis tendon transfer is a much shorter surgery, so it's kind of better um, for somebody who might be a little older who doesn't want to go under general anesthesia for very long, because the downside of a temporalis tendon transfer is it usually doesn't give you a lot of movement, whereas the free gracilis muscle transfer does. So let's talk about what these procedures are. Basically, with the temporalis tendon transfer, the temporalis is a muscle up in the head right here. And in surgery, you can take the connection off from the jaw and connect it to the corner of the mouth so that when you clench, the corner of the mouth moves up because the temporalis muscle is activated. Usually, you can only get a few millimeters of movement when that happens. Whereas a free gracilis transfer, what that is, is it's a leg muscle in the inside thigh, and that muscle is taking, taken out, and it's taken out like a transplant. And what that means is it's taken out with its artery and its vein that brings blood supply. And then it's hooked up to an artery and a vein in the neck so that blood supply is now pumped into that muscle that's been transplanted. But not only do we want the muscle to be transplanted and survive, we want the muscle to move to create a smile. So some of the nerves I kind of mentioned earlier that works for nerve transfers are also used for gracilis transfer. So for instance, the chewing nerve can be inputted into the gracilis muscle so that when you clench, your gracilis muscle moves to smile. So a lot of the strategies are kind of similar. So here is an example of a temporalis tendon transfer. So this is an intraoperative example because um, we haven't gotten her postoperative pictures yet. But basically what I'm doing here is stimulating the temporalis muscle. And you can see that the corner of the mouth moves up because she, if uh, the patient was awake, she would be clenching to smile. And this is an example of a, vesti um, a vestibular schwannoma patient who underwent a gracilis muscle transfer. So in this case, the gracilis muscle was taken out from the thigh, transplanted in the face, and I used two nerves to get it to move again. I used the opposite facial nerve. So I used the smile nerve on the other side, that's called a cross face nerve graft. And then I used the chewing nerve on that side to, so that so she can clench the smile, but also get a little emotional smile. So, um, you can see the patient smiling here and getting a nice smile, even though it's not the one she was born with, definitely gets a lot um, more smile movement than she did before that was done. So one question that always comes up is this scenario. You have undergone the vestibular schwannum or acoustic neuroma surgery. You wake up and you're told your facial nerve is intact, it's stimulated, it did well in surgery, but you wake up with facial paralysis. So what do we do? And it's perplexing for you as a patient. It's also perplexing for us as doctors because we're trying to figure out, do we wait and see if the face will recover on its own? Traditionally, we say wait a year. 
But as I kind of said, the facial nerve needs to talk to the muscles or the muscles may atrophy. And so in that sense, we're risking continued degeneration and potentially a decreased surgery um, success later on. But we also don't want to proceed with early surgery and potentially risk harming a nerve that's recovering and perform unnecessary surgery. So this dilemma is something that we encounter often because we're trying to figure out what is the best thing to do. And personally speaking, I have a lot of patients with vestibular schwannoma who really are not into the idea of having another surgery right after they had surgery because it was a lot for them. And so we have to weigh all of these things in mind. And so I know that, um, a lot of people like to see evidence and the data. And so I will provide one study for you that kind of helps me in my practice make decisions. This is a study that came out of Johns Hopkins. It's actually about 10 years old. And what they found that when they looked at about 280 patients who had facial paralysis after acoustic neuroma surgery was that if you started out with pretty much complete facial paralysis, the rate of your recovery in the first six months or so was very important. So this is a very busy slide, but what I'll show you here is bad is up here, good is here. So Asmarkman one is normal, six is complete paralysis. And what they found was that people who are gonna have a good outcome, which are these boxes, got better quicker. You can see they went from bad to good much faster than people who are gonna have a bad outcome or stay paralyzed did not improve very much. And so based on this study, uh, the conclusion was made that if you see no improvement in your full facial paralysis by six months after surgery, then it would be very important to talk to a facial nerve expert about what options you have. It doesn't mean you don't have to have surgery at six months, it means start that conversation. So hopefully that information will be helpful to you. I find that I still don't do these surgeries until closer to nine, 10 months, just to give people enough time to recover from their vestibular schwannoma surgery, also get some time to kind of feel more ready for another procedure, but this is a very helpful way of thinking about it. Now, if you wake up from facial um, vestibular schwannoma surgery and you are you don't have complete paralysis, this diagram does not pertain to you. That's a good outcome. You, you should get better if you don't wake up with full paralysis. And then I include this because we can't predict everything. So what does this picture show? So this is a younger female who came to me, not from a vestibular schwannoma, but another type of ear problem. And she came after being paralyzed um, two-ish two years later after um, undergoing some ear surgeries. And so I performed that combined nerve transfer. I talked about the hypoglossal and the master, the tongue nerve and the chewing nerve transfer two and a half years later. Um, and so I told her that I didn't know that she was gonna get anything out of the procedure, but we talked about it and we kind of decided that this was the best thing to go. She didn't want to do the chrysalis surgery. And we can see even after undergoing a surgery two and a half years later, she got improvement in both of her smile and her tone and symmetry at rest. So that's why we call it the practice of medicine is no one has the exact right answers. We just have what we think is gonna be the, is gonna make the most sense. I forgot to say also, when I'm, and the reason timing also matters is because when I do a mass center nerve transfer or a chewing nerve transfer, that procedure does not work for three to six months. So if you've been paralyzed for a year, then you add three to six months on top of that, we're getting closer to that two year mark. That's why we don't wanna wait forever. And that's why this was very astonishing to me that I did a surgery two and a half years after where I already said two years is kind of the limit and then add three to six months after that and she still got something. So it, that's why this was um, so fascinating and so great as she did get some nerve recovery. A hypoglossal nerve transfer of the tongue nerve takes more like six to 12 months to see something. And that's because that nerve has to travel quite a longer distance to get to the facial nerve. I'm gonna end this part of the talk by talking about post paralysis facial synkinesis. So I mentioned this earlier, but 15 to 50% of patients seem to develop post paralysis facial synkinesis. So what does this mean? If you imagine your facial nerve like a wire, electrical wire that sends soft branches into the face, for some reason, when it recovers, 
it recovers really funky. So the nerve that used to just go to the eye, all of a sudden sends branches off into your nose, into your mouth, into your chin, into your neck. The nerve that used to just go to the mouth is doing the same. And so you get this crisscross effect that happens. And so this is a classic picture of what happens with that. When this patient is trying to smile, her eyebrow raises up. If you ask her to raise her eyebrow, she can't really raise it, but it does go up. So that muscle is active, just not active in the right way. The eye, because it's a circle muscle, becomes smaller because that eye is tight. When she tries to smile at the corner of the mouth, there's like a tug of war that happens. The smile muscles turn on at the same time as the frown muscles turn on, at the same time as the muscles that pull out to the side. The chin muscle turns on, so it dimples, and then the neck muscle turns on, pulling everything down. So this was that picture of incomplete paralysis that I showed earlier. And so there are still treatment options for this as well. Um, what I tell patients is when this happens, it is a permanent thing, but as with all permanent medical problems, we can make them better. So I can't cure it, but I can make it better. And I think there's two to three main prongs for uh, treatment. The first one is facial neuromuscular retraining therapy. And so that's working with the therapist to try to help the nerves talk to the muscles better. Neurotoxin like Botox treatment and then surgery, selective neurolysis or myectomy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the synkinesis and Botox treatment, for instance. So this is a patient with synkinesis, so you can see our breast doesn't look too bad, actually looks fairly normal. But then once she starts to move the eyebrows, um, you can see the mouth just pulls down a little bit more. The cheek pulls, the cheek fold gets a little deeper because the cheek's being pulled up more. You can see with the tight eye closure, the neck muscle really comes out as well as the chin muscle. And then same thing with smile, the eye gets really small, then you know, the neck is activated, the chin is activated, the cheek fold is activated. Lip pucker tends to make the eye, I think, the worst out of all the movements. And then same thing with snarl. So this is a patient um, where I injected all of these areas with Botox. Oh, sorry. And these X's don't indicate like number of shots. It's just kind of showing the different muscles I inject. And you are able to get a decent improvement using therapy and Botox. And I think it's very important to do both because Botox alone is not a cure. When I tell people, um, it's like when you have a headache, you're getting Tylenol to improve the headache, but we're not necessarily treating the cause of the headache. And it's the same thing. Botox is like your headache medicine. I'm just treating some symptoms, but I'm not making the etiology of the synchinesis go away. So, you know, not a whole lot of change at rest. Maybe that corner of the mouth isn't being so pulled down. When she closes her eyes tightly, you can see that neck muscle doesn't bulge so much anymore. With the big smile, a lot more improvement in the shape of the eye, as well as the, the, um, the trajectory of the smile. So before it's down pointing, now it's more uh, stable to slightly up pointing, and then a lot more eye opening with pucker. Um, so that's all I have for you in terms of slides. So we have uh, plenty of time, 30 minutes for questions for anybody who um, uh, would like to participate. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Um, we have a couple questions on Facebook and a couple here in the, um, the Q&A chat. If you want to stop sharing your screen, then we can, um, that's always helpful. Everybody can see us. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a question, and I think you really addressed it. Um, but there was a question about from a patient who had complete paralysis for 10 months post-surgery. And just it wants to understand the realistic expectations um, from facial animation at that point. And I know you did really kind of discuss that, but I just wanted to see if you could reiterate. Yeah, I really think at 10 months it's not too late, right? Because okay. as I've seen shown you here, even two and a half years later in the right patient, specifically probably a younger patient is mm -hmm. going to get a benefit. And so it really comes down to finding a facial nerve surgeon that you like, that you connect with and can give you realistic expectations. But I consider 10 months totally an appropriate amount of time. Um, in fact, sometimes, you know, usually I'll aim like nine to 10 months to start thinking about putting the surgery on the board, but oftentimes it can be a year and a half later and I still think that's okay. Okay. Um, there are, do you, you have access to the um, Q&A, Dr. Yeah. Because <clears throat> um, there's a couple of kind of complicated questions. <laughs> I can, uh, I can take a stab at the first okay. one. So uh, I think this is a, 
um, you know, a, a really good question. So the question is, can you comment on the role of facial nerve electrodiagnostic tests for assessing, prognosticating post-op recovery for AM patients? What's the best test, uh, ENOG versus EMG and optimal time frame? Uh, certainly it comes from someone with a lot of knowledge, you know, about this. Um, I would say that uh, from my experience, so first of all, you know, what are these tests? Um, so just for the, for the, for the audience, so there are tests to, to kind of give us some quantitative information about the health of the nerve and the health of the facial muscles. And these tests are not commonly done, but they are available. So the EMG is electromyography. And that test essentially is a measurement of how are the muscles that are innervated by the facial nerve doing. Um, it's an electrical test. So uh, it's um, uh, basically electrodes actually inserted into the muscle. Um, and uh, we stimulate the muscle with the electricity and we measure the signal. So the muscles will produce a contraction depending on the, like, the, um, the electrical uh, input. So if you send a lot of electricity, the muscle will really contract. If you send a little bit, the muscle will contract a little bit. And the, full, the wave or the characteristic of that contraction can tell us a lot about the health of that muscle. And it's, you know, in a normal muscle, it has this spike, the muscle kind of contract, and then the neurons kind of relax and the muscles kind of relax. So it kind of tapers off. And when there is absolutely no nerve input, like the muscle has no nerves nourishing it, you're not going to get anything, right? Um, so the muscle is, is kind of a, a flat line or, or very low amplitude. And then there's the scenario where the muscle had an injury, uh, where the nerve maybe got uh, disrupted during surgery, or there's less nerve input for some time. Um, the muscles can undergo regeneration. So you get these different waveforms that shows that muscle actually is trying to, nerve is regenerating and trying to re-innervate that muscle. And then there's like the defibrillation, which means the nerve is, is gone and the muscle is kind of slowly withering away. So based on that, it can give us some information on how, how, how the nerve is you know, still connected to the muscle. The other test that, that they mentioned, the ENOG or ENOG, <clears throat> it's, it's electroneurography. And that's, uh, it's a comparison between the healthy side and the not healthy side. So it doesn't give us as a, uh, you know, it's not the waveform that matters, but the quant, the relative um, uh, uh, amplitude between, you know, the side where the tumor was and the side that's normal. And it's a test where you also, it's an electrical test. You send electricity at one point and you measure the um, response by the facial nerve fibers innervating the facial muscles uh, on various parts of the face. And you compare that to the normal side and you get basically how much degeneration there is on the uh, you know, tumor side or the injured side versus the normal side. So these tests are available. Um, you know, we uh, use EMG, I would say, routinely in the operating room. Um, so we actually, uh, for every acoustic case in the surgery, we run EMG throughout the case all the time, you know, because every time we're touching the nerve or removing tumor from the nerve, uh, this EMG test will show us, is, is there stimulation of the muscle? Are we pulling on the nerve too hard? So that gives us a lot of information during surgery. And in terms of the recovery, you know, ENOG often is used in other scenarios not related to tumors and is used in research a lot. But in the clinical setting, I think, you know, if, if there's no, we rely a lot on uh, physical exam, right? So if there's no movement um, after, you know, six months, nine months or a year, um, you know, my experience, we don't routinely use these tests to confirm. Uh, now you could say, well, if you want to know whether there's still nerve innervating the muscle or not, uh, you could potentially run an EMG to confirm that. Um, but I think, you know, if, if there's really no movement or if there's barely any movement after, you know, nine to 12 months, um, I think the, the, the management options doesn't really change, um, you know, if we do these tests. So I would say um, these tests are often used, you know, uh, certainly in, in the research setting and sometimes in the clinical setting for, for non-tumors, but for acoustics with um, paralysis uh, afterwards, 
Uh, it's not employed routinely. I don't know if, if Dr. Kim, do you use these, do you use the data from these tests to determine? I don't. What, what I'll tell is? patients is like, ultimately, um, you know, if it's been nine, 10 months and your EMG has what we call polyphasic muscle potentials, meaning that there's signs of recovery, then that would be one thing, but almost always you don't get enough information that's going to help you make a decision. Mm -hmm. So what I'll tell people is when I go to the OR for facial reanimation surgery, I will do an EMG intraoperatively, meaning I stimulate the nerve to see if there's muscle activity. I have never been surprised, meaning if a person clinically does not have function, I have never seen function in the operating room. And I'll tell them if I find function there, I will not cut your facial nerve because I, I will put I will put it what I call end to side, meaning I won't cut the nerve, I'll put it off to the side of the nerve. So I'm keeping that circuitry intact. I've never been surprised by that, by uh, just clinical presentations. I do not use it in my practice mm -hmm. routinely. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about facial reanimation therapy. And so there's a question about finding a physical therapist for those facial exercises um, that like the non-surgical route. How, um, you know, how are those um, specialists certified? Is there uh, anything that they need to do? And how do you find those people? I think it's very difficult. There is no certification, but I can tell you like, you know, lots of people will say, oh, I found therapy exercises online that I'm doing. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't really know what you're doing because um, either anybody can recommend therapy exercises. So what I recommend is, so I have one that I know is dedicated to facial nerve um, training, has gone to presentations, um, conferences, trying to learn more. And so that's the only person I recommend in Central Ohio for therapy because I know she has a specific interest, passion, and reads to make patients better. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would suggest is go to your local facial nerve expert or your neurotologist, and they should be able to help guide you to the local expert facial therapist. And so mine is a speech language pathologist. In other areas, it can be an occupational therapist or an actual physical therapist. So that part is going to vary. So there isn't a one easy answer for that. Um, another question we have is from a patient who um, had surgery a year and a half ago and had partial paralysis started to see improvement and, and was recovering slowly, but um, the tumor appears to be um, growing because that person might need to have surgery again. They're very concerned that they might lose any progress that they've made. Um, so have you run into that before, how another um, surgery might impact that improvement? Yeah, I think... I mean, that's a, it's a tough situation. And I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated one that, uh, you know, we have to sit down and, and think about what the options are. You know, there's a lot of information that, um, you know, that goes into deciding whether uh, we need to do surgery again. Now, if, if the remnant tumor is large, you know, how big is it? Where is it located? Is it, um, you know, affecting uh, brain stem? Is it compressing, you know, on the brain that we need to take it out. Um, another option, you know, we, we should think about is could that remnant be radiated or is it too large or is it in, in a non-favorable location? So um, if, if all of those have been sort of discussed and if surgery is really the only option, um, you know, we try everything we can do to preserve the integrity of the facial nerve. Uh, going into a uh, operative field, you know, someone has been there before, it's always more challenging. Sometimes um, you know, when we are in surgery, we try to actually find a plane between the tumor and the nerve. The nerve is often stretched to many different fibers, very thin. Sometimes that plane is, is easy, but in a, in a re-op, you know, revision or recurrent tumor, it's, it can be often quite challenging. So I think, you know, going to a, a center with, with lots of the experience is, is very important. Uh, there's a lot of intraoperative, I think, judgment uh, by the neurosurgeon and the neurotologist as well in terms of what remnant tumor should be left behind in order to preserve the integrity of the nerve. Mm -hmm. I would say that the rate, I think this also answers another question, you know, what percent have facial yes. paralysis? I think in general, revisions are higher uh, to have facial paralysis. So uh, all comers, when I talk to patients, I would say, you know, you expect some degree of facial palsy or paresis, not, in, not complete paralysis, uh, I would say in up to 10%. Um, and that number obviously is variable. If you have a very small tumor, 
um, you know, that number is, is very low, but if you have a tumor that's, you know, two, three, four centimeters, that number goes up to, you know, you expect um, to have some degree of facial paralysis. And a lot of factors goes into that, you know, if it's incomplete or if it's delayed, then the chance of recovery is typically better than if it's a dense paralysis that as soon as you wake up from surgery. But overall, I, I would say the second surgery, uh, certainly the facial nerve is, is at much higher risk um, uh, for, for getting, you know, per, uh, permanent paralysis after. Okay. Um, we have a question on our Facebook page. This one came in actually during one of our previous um, webinars and we didn't get to it, but um, a patient who's about a year out from surgery and feels like they have about 80% um, animation. So that's, that's going well but still has numbness on the whole right side um, of his head. And just wondering if that's common and if it will get better. Um, so the surgery was a few months ago? About a year ago. About a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the facial nerve uh, doesn't, is, is a movement nerve, although it's not a purely movement nerve, but uh, you know, the sensation of the face actually is supplied largely by the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve. Mm -hmm. um, now there are, you know, cutaneous or little branches uh, on the skin, you know, that are branches from other parts of the nerves that uh, supply sensation. Um, so, you know, I, I think numbness, it could be due to, you know, potentially damage to the trigeminal nerve, um, you know, mm -hmm. if it's a large tumor, sometimes, um, you know, the tumor can be so big that it actually pushes on the trigeminal nerve uh, that causes, you know, numbness. And if there were anything happened uh, during surgery or afterwards that you could have some damage to that nerve. Um, so I, I wouldn't think that was, that would be related to, you know, damage to the facial nerve per se. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, Dr. Kim, what about patients who are just almost like immediately after surgery, like maybe a month or so um, after uh, surgery who are dealing with facial um, paralysis, but it, with this patient, it was delayed. She said weakness started day five and continued today a month later, um, but it has improved. Yeah. It, close their eye and no longer need to wear an eye patch. Um, but from there, what do you typically tell patients at that point um, about their prognosis and how long are they looking at before there might be a full recovery? Yeah, I'm reading that um, question now. And that's like very reassuring actually mm -hmm. to see improvement that early on. I tell people, if you see improvement in the first few months, your likelihood of a complete or near complete recovery is quite high. Um, we, whenever we talk about facial nerve recovery, we always tell people one to two years, although I've seen people gain function even years after that. Cause I mean, the brain is an amazing thing. It's got a lot of plasticity and the way it conducts, you know, impulses to the nerve then to the muscle. I think you can never count on recovery ever ending, but I will say, um, seeing that much recovery early on is a really great sign. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. I think the, um, First, it's a delayed facial paralysis, right? So it did not start right after surgery. So that's a good sign. And the fact that it's already recovering a month later, it's a, a, also a great sign. So I think the, the prognosis is uh, very good. Okay. And then remember always that, um, you know, not going by the forehead or the lower lip, really going by exactly what this person said, the fact that you start to feel like your dryness is getting better, that maybe there's a little bit more of a crease coming. So look for those signs much before you see any movement. Okay. Um, we have another question on our Facebook page about um, Botox. And um, it was a patient, again, who's not that long out from surgery, seven months or so. Um, and did wake up with facial paralysis, but they tested the nerve and said it reacted and went from a um, house fraction six down to a two to three. So they're wondering if Botox makes sense in that situation. I think that is a very individualized question because, um, you know, can anybody and everybody benefit from Botox? Sure. I mean, a lot of people get it for just cosmetic purposes to help with wrinkles and symmetry and things like that, and even people who don't have tumors. And so it's very well possible that you might benefit, but it really requires a consultation with the physician who can administer 
facial paralysis Botox comfortably because it's a little different than your cosmetic indications. The muscles I treat, as you saw, are a whole lot of different muscles. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would suggest is getting, if you feel like there's some things that you think could be more symmetric about the face, then certainly get a consult and try mm -hmm. to see if that would be an option for you. That's yeah. not comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are a um, um, couple yeah. of questions uh, reading the chat and the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a question about, um, let's see, there was a, a, a three to four millimeter tumor being observed, uh, but it thought could be on the facial nerve and there's some mild asymmetry. There's also a question about uh, someone with a facial, possibly a facial schwannoma um, and uh, the, the risk of facial paralysis. So, um, so, uh, so, you know, we're talking about vestibular schwannomas, but, uh, it's actually sometimes impossible um, to tell preoperatively what that tumor is. The majority of the tumors that arise in this location in the brain are vestibular schwannomas, um, but sometimes uh, they are actually coming from the facial nerve. You know, the facial nerve and the hearing nerve, they are two nerves that travel really side by side. Um, you know, on an MRI is sometimes really hard to tell. Uh, other times you can actually follow the facial nerve and you see the tumor kind of traveling along it. Um, with a three to four millimeter tumor, sometimes it's just impossible to tell, but if it is thought to be on the facial nerve, um, uh, which, you know, certainly might be, and if there's mild facial asymmetry, that may suggest that it's on the facial nerve. It's a, it's a tough, um, tumor. Um, you know, the interventions, the problem with, with this is surgery to remove this tumor, um, doesn't do so well for the facial nerve function. So in order to remove this tumor, because the tumor comes from the nerve, it's, it's impossible to separate you know, normal nerve fibers from the tumor, especially if the tumor is small. Often you know, what happens is we try to peel off what we think is tumor from the nerve, or sometimes we have to cut the nerve, uh, take that chunk out with the tumor and then re-suture the nerve back. If that were the case, if the nerve was cut and reconnected, um, you are at best getting a House Brackman 4, uh, which uh, ideally we want something that, you know, looks symmetric, you can get good eye closure, but often that is not the case, unfortunately, just because even when we cut it and reconnect it, the nerve doesn't like it and the regeneration also, the wires tend to cross and then you get a lot of synchinesis as well. So it's, it's, it's a difficult scenario. We often, in these cases, would our goal is to preserve facial function for as long as possible, knowing that if we intervene, the function will, will be worse at best to a House Brackman 4 or 3. So if, if, if the patient currently has a House Brackman 5 or 6, it makes the decision somewhat easier, right? Because we can get it, we can't get it any worse and we can get the tumor out. However, if, if, if you have normal facial nerve function, probably the best is to wait. And obviously you wanna discuss this with, with the surgeon and with everybody to make sure that everyone sort of is on the same page. Um, same thing with a facial schwannoma. Um, you know, sometimes we do do a decompression. So we would remove the bone around the nerve. Uh, the thinking is that if the nerve is as a tumor on it is growing and that puts pressure on the nerve because it's surrounded by bone because it travels in a bony tunnel. If we remove that bony tunnel, we kind of let, give it the room for the tumor to grow. That will prolong sort of the, the time at which the nerve uh, still functions. And eventually that if that tumor continues to grow, it can still cause deterioration of the nerve. But um, you know, these are, these are tough uh, scenarios. I certainly, you know, would, you know, have a very, you know, thorough discussion about, you know, sometimes it's, it's better not to intervene immediately because the outcomes are just not as good. I actually have like a little bit of a different perspective as a facial nerve expert or, you know, doing facial nerve surgery is, you know, the classic um, approach is to wait till the, the tumor takes so much of your facial nerve function that at that point, let's take the tumor out because it's already kind of there. My thought is let's try to save your muscles if we can. And so in cases where before that tumor comes out, but they're just starting to get to house Brackman two or three, meaning just starting to see some asymmetry, I might go in there and do a mass nerve transfer, which is 
it can be an outpatient surgery that takes like three hours to do to hook up the masseter nerve so that something is providing a little energy while we're making some decisions about a tumor that's a much bigger deal. And so that could be an option that really is um, a little outside of the box and it is something only probably facial nerve surgeons will offer you, but is a very valid option because when we do mass nerve transfers, um, you cut a branch that does smile. But as I showed in my second slide, there's lots of branches that can often do the smile. So cutting one is not usually a big deal. And certainly I, don't, I wouldn't cut it until I stimulated and saw that multiple branches did it. So keep that in your mind is if you have a facial nerve schwannoma, you're starting to see a little bit of function loss, but you're not quite ready with your surgeon at getting the tumor out, is involving a facial nerve surgeon for possibly doing a nerve transfer to give some muscles some energy so that you don't deteriorate them completely. You have to lose a lot of the facial nerve actually to see a, a clinical difference. So we wanna try to prevent that from happening. Um, I'm going to answer this question for the masseter nerve real quick that's in the chat okay. too. The masseter to facial nerve graft is generally speaking done distally as, as it was mentioned in this question. So when we do a masseter nerve transfer, as I said, I'm trying to find the nerve branch that does smile. In a patient, I'm doing reanimation after vestibular schwannoma. That's difficult because none of the nerves stimulate. So I have to anatomically pick the nerve that I think goes to the zygomaticus muscle, which is your main smile muscle, cut that, and then hook it up to the masseter nerve. The reason why this is done there is because really the masseter nerve is the best for smile. As I mentioned, you have to clench to turn your masseter nerve muscle on, right? When you're at rest, your chewing muscle should not be turned on. And so there's no reason to put that into the main facial nerve because you're not sending something that's on all the time. And so if you clenched and you sent it to the main facial nerve, then all of your face muscles would move and that would not be ideal. You really want to focus that energy to the smile. That's why it's really focused on that. Now, when I do a masseter nerve transfer, I hope I get a little something to the eye because it is normal to have a little crow's feet when someone smiles. So that synkinesis is actually a good synkinesis. I like that synkinesis to happen. But that is the reasoning why the hypoglossal nerve or the tongue nerve is put in the main trunk to send energy all throughout the face. And the masseter nerve is just strictly for the smile in most cases. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, great point. That's awesome. Um, we have a question in, in um, on the Facebook page about um, acupuncture or dry needling, mm -hmm. there's, you know, B12 vitamins. Is there anything that you recommend that's like not non-surgical and, and not necessarily the facial reanimation therapy that we discussed um, for people to kind of um, boost regeneration? So all of those things have not a strong amount of evidence behind them. And so my philosophy is if it makes you feel good, if it lowers your stress and you feel like you're being proactive and you're not taking so much B vitamin, that you go into toxicity and it doesn't make you broke, go all for it because it's something, right? And as a physician, I don't know that what you do, like acupuncture is not going to help. I cannot be, I don't know um, everything. And so I always tell patients, you make those decisions. I don't see a problem with it as long as it's not going to stress you out financially, psychologically, emotionally to do so. Okay. You know, one thing I was uh, taught during training is that, uh, you know, all these things are perfectly reasonable to, to do if it lowers your, your stress and it feels good to get, you know, mm -hmm. massaged or more. Um, but one thing I was told was that, you know, we shouldn't send electric, electrical current. You know, sometimes when they do acupuncture, they put the needle and they actually send a little zap um, because you want um, uh, the nerve to kind of send out signals like come re or, you know, the muscle to kind of send the signal to get the nerve there. If you're, se if you're uh, sending an electrical current like externally, that might suppress your own body's way to kind of reconnect. Uh, I don't know if, if that's something that Dr. Kim, you, you, you tell patients not to get like electrical stimulation directly, um, you know, but uh, massage and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. hundred percent. I completely agree. Do not do tens stimulation. Um, and that's the problem I have sometimes is if you go to a local therapist, they may put tens stimulation on your list of things to do. And, um, you know, that reasoning as well. And then two, if you're starting to see functional recovery, 
and you stick a electrical stimulator on all the muscles of the face, like we kind of think it might make synkinesis worse because you're non-selectively activating muscles and turning things on because TENS units are not specific to the zygomaticus. They're just being placed on the surface of your skin. And so I highly recommend that as well, avoid electrical stimulation. Okay. Um, we talked a lot about the facial, um, the facial schwannomas and and kind of the intervention and maybe intervening early with those. Does the same go for um, vestibular schwannoma? If you start to see um, ticks or anything happening um, when you are either waiting for surgery or, or on watch and wait, does that mean that you're going to have facial issues following treatment? Um. I think, um, you know, we always want to think about, is this a, for sure, a vestibular schwannoma? Sometimes we're not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, everything looks like one, smells like one, but, you know, one thing we always do in surgery is before we take out any tumor, we use a probe and we touch, we probe everything around the tumor to make sure that it is not a facial schwannoma. And there are cases where we go in, we're all prepared to take out this tumor, and, um, you know, it, it stimulates. So it's yeah. part of a facial nerve. And then we, we don't take out the tumor because, uh, you know, we would result in a facial paralysis afterwards. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's always uh, something that we do as surgeons. We confirm that this is indeed not a facial schwannoma. Um, the reason I say that is because most vestibular schwannomas, they don't, uh, even though they're, um, you know, arises from the cochlear and uh, balance nerves that they're right adjacent to the facial nerve, they don't actually uh, cause kind of this facial paralysis preoperatively. It's even with large tumors, it's a little, little uh, unusual, it's, I guess. Um, sometimes they cause some facial numbness, so they can push on the trigeminal nerve, and large vestibular schwannomas can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if the tumor is not large and if if you're having some ticks or some sort of maybe the movement is a little different, I'd be, you know, thinking about could this actually be a facial schwannoma? And that, that going to surgery, that is certainly something that you know we need to take that into account. Okay. Um, Dr. Kim, I know you have to write it um, right at five thirty, so I, this might be our last question. But um, we get this a lot where people um, have taste um, issues following surgery, and so there's a question on Facebook um, that if someone would address the taste disorder associated with synkinesis. And um, this person particularly has sour, bitter, or burning tastes and, and her tastes have just changed um, since her surgery. Why is that? Oh my gosh, I mean, Dr. Ren might be able to answer that better. I mean, it's because the corda tympani nerve is part of the facial nerve that does the taste. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually don't really know too much about whether, um, taste function can be modulated. Do you know, Dr. Ren? Yeah, you know, we often, so, you know, taste, I would say in ear surgery, taste often gets disrupted just because the corda tympani nerves, Dr. Kim said, is a branch of the facial nerve. It comes right off of it in the, in the temporal bone behind the ear, and it travels right under the eardrum. And we often manipulate that nerve during ear surgery, and patients would have a bitter metallic or numbness in that part of the tongue for as much as three to six months. It's mm -hmm. temporary, but you know, three to six months is, is, is a long time. And in vestibular schwannoma surgery, you know, we are peeling tumor off of the main trunk of the facial nerve. So the nerve to taste fibers run in, in, in a bundle that's part of that. And sometimes that fiber, as we, we, as we use that to kind of find the facial nerve, and we know that branch is not the branch that moves the face is called nervous intermedius. And we, we sometimes do take that nerve in order to get the tumor off of the main, you know, movement part of the facial nerve. So, um, you know, for the taste, I, I usually counsel patients that, you know, it's, it's one side and often the nerve from the other side can kind of compensate and uh, taste is, is, is part of that sensation, but the smell and, and you know, the other part of the tongue can also compensate. Uh, but if, if the quarter tympani nerve is cut, usually that's a temporary uh, thing that uh, three to six months is what I would give as a, as a you know, uh, wait time before we see if there's any recovery. Great. All right. Well, that's going to be our last question um, today. Thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for some really great information and to you and Dr. Ren for answering all these questions. Um, we hope that you guys will come back tomorrow 
um, Dr. Adunka and Dr. Wren will um, be talking with Bora Dawson, who's an AN patient. And we're going to talk about, about surgery and the patient experience, as well as the provider experience. Um, that presentation is scheduled for five o'clock Eastern time, two o'clock Pacific. So thank you again, doctors. This was excellent. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you for having me. Yep. All right. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.